Grenada is a small island nation, a hundred miles north of Venezuela, situated in the Caribbean Sea. In 1974, Grenada gained independence from Great Britain. The first post-independence Prime Minister was Sir Eric Gary of the Grenada United Labour Party. In 1976, there was a general election on the island, and Gary claimed victory. But civil unrest broke out when the opponent did not accept the election result. The main opposition to Gary was Morris Bishop's New Dual Movement, the NJM, and after years of strife, Bishop launched a coup when Gary was out of the country on the 13th of March 1979, seizing power. Bishop created a so-called People's Revolutionary Government, and soon welcomed hundreds of Cuban construction workers and military advisers into the country. This close relationship with Fidel Castro alarmed the United States. Bishop grew increasingly unpopular in Grenada, and in September 1983 he reluctantly agreed to share power with Deputy Prime Minister Bernard Cord. However, in a confrontation between civilians supporting Bishop and Grenadian soldiers supporting Cord, 19 people were killed, including Bishop. The commander of the Grenadian army, General Hudson Austin, effectively took power in Grenada. The Organization of Eastern Caribbean States appealed for intervention in Grenada. By rights, such a military intervention should have been the prerogative of the former colonial power, Britain, as Grenada was part of the British Commonwealth. But the UK had just fought the difficult Falklands War the year before against Argentina in the South Atlantic. Due to US problems with Cuba since the 1950s and a feeling that the Caribbean was within the American sphere of influence, President Ronald Reagan decided to intervene. Early this morning, forces from six Caribbean democracies and the United States began a landing or landings on the island of Grenada in the Eastern Caribbean. We have taken this decisive action for three reasons. First, and to overriding importance to protect innocent lives, including up to a thousand Americans whose personal safety is, of course, my paramount concern. Second, to forestall further chaos. And third, to assist in the restoration of conditions of law and order and of governmental institutions to the island of Grenada where a brutal group of leftist thugs violently seized power, killing the prime minister, three cabinet members, two labor leaders, and other civilians, including children. Let there be no misunderstanding. This collective action has been forced on us by events that have no precedent in the Eastern Caribbean and no place in any civilized society. American lives are at stake. We've been following the situation as closely as possible. Between 800 and 1,000 Americans, including many me medical students and senior citizens, make up the largest single group of foreign residents in Grenada. From the, the United States moved quickly to assemble sufficient forces to take the island in an ambitious airborne and amphibious assault. The forces consisted of U.S. Army Rangers, the 82nd Airborne Division, U.S. Marines, Army Delta Force, U.S. Navy SEALs, and support troops, totaling 7,600 personnel, with additional support from Caribbean forces. One of the most important opening missions of the invasion was the capture of Grenada's two airports, to allow a rapid build-up of U.S. forces on the island. Operation Urgent Fury would involve the U.S. Marines capturing Pearls Airport using landing craft and helicopters, and at the same time, the Army's 75th Rangers would seize Point Salines Airport using two battalions. The plan was for one company of Rangers to land on Salines Airport by parachute, then the rest would land aboard C-130 Hercules transports and come rolling out the back, in armoured jeeps, just like the Israeli operation at Entebbe Airport in Uganda in 1976. Then, a few hours later, a battalion of the 82nd Airborne would be brought in by C-130s as reinforcements. That, at least, was the plan. However, on the 25th of October 1983, a US Air Force AC-130 Spectre, operating from Florida, reported that the runway at Point Salines was blocked with vehicles, oil drums and construction equipment. 
two hours behind the AC-130, were the MC-130 transport aircraft carrying the two battalions of rangers. The original mission plan was quickly scrubbed, now that the C-130s could not land on the runway. Both ranger battalions would now parachute directly onto the airport in broad daylight. The rangers began in-flight rigging, hurriedly removing machine guns and mortars from vehicles and loading them in weapons containers for the jump. Rifles and grenade launchers were likewise attached to webbing. The men were informed that the jump was to be made at minimum altitude of 500 feet. Also, reserve parachutes were not to be worn. The rangers wouldn't have had time to use them if their main chutes had failed. Point Salines airport was defended by one company of Cuban infantry. Most of the other local Cuban and Grenadian troops were dug in along the coast expecting an amphibious assault on the airport. The airport defenders were armed with AK-47 rifles and RPK machine guns. The rangers would also be facing considerable anti-aircraft fire from several emplaced ZPU 23mm anti-aircraft cannons and the transport aircraft would be under intense fire as they approached the airport. The rangers under flak and small arms fire the moment they exited the aircraft. The Americans could count on air support from Spectre gunships and US Navy A-7 jets. In total, 13 American transports and Spectres approached the airport. The 1st Battalion, 75th Rangers, in the leading aircraft, with the 2nd Battalion following behind. As they approached the island, the jump masters ordered everyone to their feet. Such was the volume of anti-aircraft fire aimed at the leading US aircraft that it was decided to abort the jump to allow the Spectres to deal with the Cuban guns. The order of attack was also quickly reversed. The 1st Battalion would circle the airport, while the 2nd Battalion jumped first, then follow them in. As the first wave of transports reached the drop zone, the order to abort was sent, but a mix-up aboard the 3rd aircraft, carrying the 1st Battalion's command group, caused the jump light to turn green, and Lieutenant Colonel Wesley Taylor and 30 men shotgunned out the side doors and into the sky that was filled with flying lead. Taylor and his men landed safely and divided into two squads, the Rangers going straight into action. The Spectres now attacked the anti-aircraft guns, but the Cubans fought well, hitting both Spectres and paratroop transports. However, the Spectres' massive weight of fire cleared some of the guns, and the stage was now set for the main drop. The aircraft carrying the 75th Rangers' 2nd Battalion approached Point Salines, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Hagler. Below, Colonel Taylor and his men were being mortared by the Cubans. The jump lights turned green. In 21 seconds, all 250 Rangers exited the aircraft into a dangerous 20-knot ground wind, aiming for a drop zone bordered by water on both sides. Even though considerable ground fire filled the air, only one Ranger was injured and he broke his leg on landing. Another was blown off course and landed in the sea. He swam ashore. Two men hung up as they jumped and were pulled back inside the aircraft. Landing under fire, the rangers quickly organized themselves and began to clear the runway of obstacles. Some of the rangers hot-wiring Cuban bulldozers to assist them. The rangers also began to assault the Cuban positions. Company B, 1st Battalion, rolled up the Cubans' flank from west to east. Several small actions were fought as the Rangers cleared out Cuban positions, killing 20 and capturing several dozen, while Ranger snipers suppressed the Cuban mortars. At the same time, the 1st Battalion's Company A attacked east to west, using a bulldozer as an improvised tank, while other Rangers took out a ZPU anti-aircraft gun, using the captured gun to fire on the main Cuban camp. 175 Cubans surrendered shortly afterwards. At this point, Cuban troops manning beach defences began to converge on the airport, and in a brief but fierce battle, the Rangers 1st Battalion defeated a Cuban infantry company, then cleared the eastern end of the airport. In the meantime, the Cubans launched an armoured counterattack on Point Salines that struck the Rangers 2nd Battalion. Cuban infantry was supported by three BTR-60 armoured personnel carriers of the Grenadian Army. 
The Rangers knocked out two of the BTRs with recoilless rifles, and the third was destroyed by a combination of Spectre gunship fire and more recoilless rifle rounds. Aside from some sniper fire, Point Salines Airport was open to receive U.S. reinforcements by mid-morning, the first 82nd Airborne paratroopers arriving at 14.05 hours. The assault on Point Salines Airport had been a daring U.S. operation in broad daylight against a well-armed, though surprised opponent. Ranger casualties were very light considering. Five killed and six wounded on the first day of operations in Grenada, and they managed to locate 140 of the American students on the island on that first day. Some tough fights remained for all U.S. forces on Grenada over the following days until the Cuban and Grenadian forces were defeated and democracy restored once more to the island. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.